I'm presenting today Climate Fiction for Future Ancestors and uh, this amazing crew that's going to be talking about this. And the conversation started um, in the middle of COVID and it was in the middle of a um, visioning quest that we brought together. Um, and um, I'm going to get into that because I think it's important um, that we talk about the people who we had that experience with. But first, I'm going to introduce um, everyone and get this uh, started. I'm uh, Tori Stevens at FIX, which is GRIS Solutions Lab, and we're um, just so excited to get into this and chop it up with the folks that we have here. We have some um, authors, narrative shifters, journalists, um, and professors that are all going to talk about this um, amazing, pro amazing project that we launched um, in January of this year. We um, we'll get into things like uh, whether or not uh, empathy in storytelling is um, how important that is, especially in this moment that we're in. We're going to talk about the craft of writing and building worlds and just worlds. We're going to talk about um, all these things with these interesting folks and about race as well. Um, imagine 2200 called for a lot of things. It was a it was jam packed with a lot of call to actions. And so we're going to just unpack those a little bit and discuss them, um, have fun with them, and um, just see what folks are thinking around this project. We're also going to chop it up with Brian Khan, who's um, with the Columbia Climate School um, and uh, Climate Society. So now that we're um, you know just moving in this direction with everything, I want to talk about the um, sponsors and partners that made this possible. We have Orion Magazine, who has been super helpful in getting the word out there and just a really great partner. We have um, also the Columbia School, um, who is at the table um, and has many of you all probably joined us um, because you heard about this through Columbia. Thank you so much to Columbia University and the Climate School. Um, and the other partner, which has been so you know helpful, um, this is the first year we're doing this. So NRDC came through as a sponsor and, you know, um, put down some funds for this. So we wouldn't be here without them. So really want to appreciate them. Um, and I'm going to kick it over for a second um, to give it a Emmeline. Um, and Emmeline's going to talk about NRDC. Thank you, Tori. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, my name is Emmeline Steven Yanum. I'm the social media manager at NRDC and a proud alum of Columbia's Climate and Society program. I graduated back in 2016, where Lee Brian Kahn was one of my instructors, and you'll hear more from him later. I was really excited when I learned that NRDC was supporting the Imagine 2200 contest, along with today's event to help kick off Climate Week New York City. Um, today's event celebrates the growing body of climate fiction, a class of stories we need right now to face our climate challenges head on and help us imagine a future where a better world is possible. The rise of cli-fi as a genre speaks to the power of storytelling to break open our capacity to dream, imagine, and act together to address the climate crisis. At NRDC, we will continue to support this creativity by lifting up new voices across our channels, partnering with Hollywood through our Rewrite the Future initiative to encourage more accurate depictions of the climate reality, and by continuing to push for policies and solutions that will create a just and equitable future for us all. Thank you for including me in today's event and for all the great work bringing these inspiring stories together to the page. And Tori, back to you. Thank you so much for that, Emily. And so before we get into this, I just wanna talk a little bit about the program that I um, am involved in and work at. Uh, so I mentioned that uh, FIX is GRIS Solutions Lab. And what we do there is bring people together around climate solutions. We, unlike um, Grist, Grist is focused on the news. So if Joe Biden fired the EPA director today, they'd report about it and they would most likely have to because it's breaking news. However, we're different. We are focused on climate solutions and the people behind those solutions. We write about those folks. We write about where that particular climate solution is, is heading or just give you a deep dive on it. Um, and we also bring those folks together for private discussions and public discussions just like this. 
So um, I was giving an ode to the private discussion we had at the beginning of COVID, where we workshopped this whole initiative to some degree. We brought together some amazing folks in our um, network. We, we call them fixers because they're looking to fix the climate crisis we're in in a variety of ways. And we brought those folks together to do a visioning quest. How do we get to 2200 and get there in the place B and Mother Earth and our place in it be clean, green, and just? And so from there, we built, and I, I was like imagining, what, what could this be? And so we turned it into a climate fiction initiative. We took the musings of all those people and we we pushed them all together. Um, and we we I, I drew also some inspiration from folks in the Afrofuturist community. Had some amazing talks with Cherie Renee Thomas, who you'll hear from later. Um, and solar pumps. Um, these movements really gave me a lot of inspiration for how we can move this forward. Um, and a thing I want to say about the initiative: at first, you know, very nervous to try to get uh, a new initiative off the ground at Grist. And so we said, you know, first year, it'd be amazing if we got 250 stories. Lo and behold, we were able to get 1,100 stories from 85 countries. I, when I woke up the, net, the morning when we closed the portal for the stories to come in and I saw that, I was just like really running around my house and my dog was like, well, what are you doing? <laughs> Stop. Um, so you might hear us today talk about climate fiction or interchangeably use the word cli-fi. Um, for folks, I'm not big on like using genre. So for me, I'll be using climate fiction just to keep it um, clean and um, like everyone can kind of just understand. Uh, so we have these all-star narrative weavers I talked about earlier. Um, we're going to chop it up with them in a moment. And we're not, today we probably won't get into talking about the stories so much, but more of that container. Right. So like what was the call to action that we put out there for the world around intersectional, hopeful or hope filled stories um, and then the craft of writing and, and things around futurism. So um, now I'm going to jump into the discussion part of this uh, and, you know, I'll just like start with my first question. Uh, and so my first question, I want to ask Cherie. Um, and I, I want to talk about world building and the the craft that is needed to, to to build a future, like in writing. So, like you build worlds. People who write speculative fiction, cli-fi or climate fiction, and science fiction, you have to build worlds. So, um, just want to know if there's any tips because there was a lot of like when people registered and they had questions, there was a ton of writers in the room that want to know about, you know, a variety of questions, but world building was one of them. So if you could talk about um, your mechanics around world building, and then I don't know if this is separate, but if you're world building for a just world, can you speak to that too? Mm, that's a great question. All right, well, world building um, is the aspect of the story in which you create the background, the environment in which the characters are moving and acting and making their choices in. It is the space in which um, all of the themes of the story are kind of embedded and all of the dialogue and all of the, um, all of the action takes place in this world that you've created. Um, sometimes with you know, mimetic fiction, it's easier sometimes because we are all kind of connected to the, you know, a similar idea of what the world is, right? So if I say I'm setting a story in New York, we have a, a rough idea of what New York is and you don't have to do as much world building for that. But if you're writing a story that's set in the future or a story set really far in the past or a story that's off earth, you have to create some of that background for your readers so that it becomes a natural part of the storytelling. So it's not only the geographical or the, or the landscape, the flora and the fauna of the storytelling, but it's also, um, the cultural things that are part of it, the rules, the way the laws operate, the way society moves, the way people court each other or fall in love, the way families are organized and what they eat and the language they speak. All of that is part of your world building. And for, um, for speculative fiction, science fiction, fantasy, horror, things like that, um, you are, have a, a, a larger responsibility um, to make that um, clear for your reader and to make it consistent for, for the world that you've created and for it to make sense, right? So you bring that through. Um, so one of the things that we were all looking at is the world building. And there were so many examples of that in the um, stories that were submitted for the uh, competition, all kinds of world building 
um, the work that stood out, of course, is the work that was exploring what Tori just asked so wonderfully about justice. You know, how do you create a world that's different from the world that we're in right now that has a different relationship to justice? What does that look like? Um, and, you know, there were a lot of different ways in which people um, achieved that. Some of them made it already a, a given and that we were operating under asking different questions within this wonderful context in which the world had already arrived at some solutions. Some stories they were making the characters were at a pivotal moment because of course the short story is always about why this moment right now was the catalyst for telling us this snippet of the story now. Um, what changes for the main character on this day of all days. And they made it so that we were a part of that journey that the characters were making. They were um, trying to figure it out um, in that moment while the, they set up the world for us to, to experience um, as well, so. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks so much. And we might return to that question a little bit to dig deeper into it if we have some time. Um, next question, I, I really want to get into this, um, a, a discussion around race, right? So what I was chopping it up with Kiase last week and Adrian and Kiase was, and I were talking about uh, characters and how sometimes characters in fiction and, um, you know, Hollywood or wherever you find them are uh, too narrow, you know, like, so a character will, they'll name check that the character has, is brown, or they'll name check that the character um, has like a, a, a certain hair type, but, but that's as far as it goes, you know, um, and, and what I want to know and talk about is how culture, um, uh, you know, interacts with race and how that is a place that we can go deeper with a character. And sometimes I, I just don't see, or I often don't see it. There's a lot of good shows and there's a lot of good fiction that's coming out these days where it's happening, but it's, I wouldn't say it's the norm. You know, you have a um, BIPOC character that could be changed out, right? You know, he, this person's a chef, they're black, um, they, they look black, but that's it. Like you don't learn too much more other than like that they, you know, kind of filled this um, slot. And so, I, I, you know, a good example of this is um, Samuel Jackson. I'm a big Star Wars geek, and mm -hmm. Samuel Jackson, who I love, so I'm not going to, like, throw under the bus or anything in that way, um, showed up in Star Wars when I was, like, a, a younger man. And I love that. Like, it, I was so excited about that. But the piece that's missing is the, the cultural piece. And this isn't just in Star Wars. This is in, like, lots of, you know, film um, or stories. Uh, and so... You know, like I wrote this essay for it to anchor or have uh, as a part of this collection, and I talked about my grandmama's couch having plastic on it. I talked about like the um, Trinidadian um, neighbor that I had that had like a roti, um, you know, like it wasn't a shop. It was like a tool shed that like was, you know, roti was served pumpkin and shrimp on the weekend, and I'd get three of them and freeze them. So like that's the kind of like storytelling, that cultural authenticity that I'm um, sometimes I'm missing. I want to ask you, Kiase, why, why does that keep, why, why do we not see that sort of like robust, robust storytelling um, where culture is kind of like infused into the story? <laughs> oh, I love that question. Um, I mean, at, at the end of the day, we don't see that much, Tori, because it's one way for the powerful to stay powerful. I think we're all born um, into like racial legends and one of the legends that I think I was born into was this notion of whiteness and racelessness being synonymous, right? And so if whiteness and raceless, racelessness are synonymous, we it's easy for one to come to the conclusion that racelessness and whiteness are universal. And I think, you know, thankfully we, we've had so many incredible, well, not enough incredible, but so many incredible writers and cultural workers who've pushed back on this no notion of whiteness, um, quote unquote, straightness, um, being the center. And I think the reason that often we don't see that pushed up against is because to push up against that is literally, you're going to make a lot of people who like to be employed unemployed uh, or disemployed. But, but, but the wonder about it and the scary, well, the scary part about it to me is that everyone who writes a story in this nation ever is writing a racial story, a racialized story. They're purporting some sort of racialized legend. We all are. And, and I think what's important for me in reading these stories is 
I needed to remind myself that unless you're doing the work to think about the way ability, space, place, sexuality, gender, um, all of those things inflect and create like racial legends, you're not doing, I think, honest, just racial work. Similarly, if you're thinking about writing stories about what we call gender, you're not looking at race, place, size, and everything. I don't know the kind of gendered work you're doing, but I know not doing that work is, I think, encouraging the same sorts of powerful people to have the same sorts of power, powerful positions that I would argue they use to often abuse us through narrative. And I think what we have to do as writers is pinpoint the ways that we often engage in abuse of people we purport to love through writing these narratives that erase or, you know, sort of re reascribe the same racial legend, if we're talking about race, that we were sort of born into. So at the end of the day, I think people do it because it's lucrative. And thankfully, I think people are pushing back because we all want parts of our body, parts of our great grandmama and them's bodies to live and exist. And they were born into a world where they were taught that like they could not exist except in one space or place. So um, it's, it's capitalism. But also, I think imagination is also the only thing that can ever confront capitalism um, and give it and give it a fair shake. And I think that's what a lot of these writers that we read are doing. And I know that's what the writers um, who I'm lucky enough to judge with are doing as well. So thank you. Yeah, I really feel that piece on imagination. Um, we, we really wanted to figure out and explore and that a lot of this project is to figure out how do you decolonize the imagination, right? So because even what people um, try to imagine, they're sort of like, like you said, we're all grew up in this racialized system. So, you know, how do you how do you move beyond that? How do you play with that? How do you push back on that? Um, and the imagination is a good place to do that. And people are doing it. Um, and many of the stories that were featured did do that. Um, well, I'm going to move the ball around a little bit. Uh, so uh, let me ask this question uh, to, to Morgan. Um, you know, you talked about last week, and I'm, I'm going to reference and I'm going to keep saying like, oh, last week we talked about this because it was just such a beautiful conversation between all of these folks. And there were some things that came out and I want to share them with you, the audience and folks listening um, or watching or whatever. Um, so Morgan, you talked about these multiple, I, I said, what, what's going on? How are you feeling about the climate right now? Which is a big question, but you said the multiple emergencies that are happening at once. You said there's fires happening in the West. This hurricane just blew through my town or the one that you grew up in. There had never been like tornadoes there um, in New Jersey. That's where um, you grew up. And uh, also like the, you know, many people died in New Jersey, which we thought this thing was going to hit hard in the South. And it did hit hard in the South, but the New Jersey was kind of like something unexpected. And you said this multiple emergencies that we're feeling ha has me reeling. And I don't understand why we as a, a country don't emotionally address it. So does, does, does fiction and storytelling offer up um, a place to kind of address what, what I think you're itching at? And so I don't wanna put words in your mouth, mouth, but you know, like this, an empathy gap that might be happening in America. Does America have an empathy problem and can storytelling address it? Oh, hell yeah. Excuse me. I hope I can curse. But do we have an empathy problem? Yes, we do. Um, and that has been made quite clear through the pandemic. Um, even me, like I feel like I, I even tweeted about this. Like I feel like my well of compassion has been drying up when you see the sheer uh, cruelty and selfishness on display for another person. Um, and I think you know, this sort of Western individualist mindset, doggy dog, I'm only out for mine is, is, is getting us right now, us in the general sense, you know, and not us and we, I'm not speaking French here. Um, but, but what I will say is, it's like to not sound religious, you know, I'm a Christian. So I think about how words are magic, right? If you look in like the book of Genesis, it starts in the beginning was the word, right? So word holds, words have so much power. Words have so much alchemy. So I definitely believe that fiction is a place where we not just should go, but not we can go, that we should go there. Because most of the things that we see nowadays in terms of inventions and innovations all started with someone's imagination. I think it's so important to you know, turn to fiction, particularly 
with a lot of these these Afrofuturist griots that we have, right, who are prophetic in a sense, right? They, they're prophetic in a sense of what they knew what the world was going to come to and the type of decisions we have to make, not only for our community, but for each other. So I think that a contest like this was so important because even as I was reading all of these different stories, in my mind, I was like, whoa, how did you even think about that? How could you make me think about spirits and bodies and natural resources and synthetic resources in a way that I hadn't even thought about before? Because on the one hand, I'm spending so much time panicking and there's a space to panic, but there's also a space for when you get down from that panic to understand that there's this sort of like supernatural heartbeat going on amongst other creators who even in the midst of all of this uh, turmoil and chaos, something's going to break through from that. So I think that, you know, participating in this and those who decide to share their words with, with us, um, we all just, it was a project of hope, I believe. I wouldn't have taken on this assignment. I'm sure I could say this for, you know, the co-judges as well. We wouldn't have taken on this assignment in doing this if we didn't have some belief somewhere in there, in the midst of the frustration with the, with the world, that something could be born new again. So, yeah. Yeah, that's what's up. We, we definitely took a leap when we were um, designing this. And I, I had the inspiration of those folks in the Afrofuturist community and then the solar pump community. I'm like, they're talking, there's a lot of pushback against systems that are um, hampering all of us in, in those uh, movements. They've been talking about this for a long time. And then also the, the from the solar punk angle, that, that optimism and those like climate solutions. Uh, so I wanna uh, direct this next question to Adrian. So I, I think I referenced my dog um, earlier, <laughs> um, Akila, um, but, uh, what I want to talk about is like I go on walks in the morning and I like kind of ruminate on, you know, what's going on with me and, you know, just what's going on in the wor world. It's like kind of a meditation slash, um, you know, kind of thinking session. And so I've, something you said last week uh, has stuck with me. You said the future, we need to figure out what we want to bring into the future and what we want to leave behind. Mm -hmm. And then you got more specific and you said, what does blackness look like in the future? What does gender look like in the future? What does sexuality look like in the future? What does feminism look like in the future? And what do we need to leave behind? And I was like, I just been thinking about that. Like, what do we need to leave behind is like a lot of what I've been thinking about, but, but that's not all of it. And so I just wanted you to expound on that and talk about that for a bit. Yeah, uh, thanks for remembering that. I, it's also been, Digging around in my head. This is what I'm thinking about all the time. And, you know, I think about this because we were given these identities as reductions, as insults, like as a way to take power from us. And we were human all along. We've always been human. We've always been creating culture all along. And so when, you know, for Black people, we were given Blackness as this little labor box of what we were supposed to do. We were reclaiming everything all along. We figured out a way to survive. And I've been reading, um, I've been, I'm reading a bunch, but I was like, I need to bring these books into the conversation because both of them, Wicked Flesh and The Prophets, it's reminding me that the stories we've been told about what Blackness is are not true stories. And we're going back and reclaiming those stories, which I think helps us think in different ways about what it can be. And I think some of the things that have come clear to me is capitalism makes every aspect of who we are labor, like everything. If you love doing it, it's labor. If you hate doing it, it's labor. And identity was just a way to unfairly distribute that labor, right? Like that's what it's been for Black people. That's what it's been for women. That's what it's been for all of us. It's like you will hurt and you will do more and you will have less. And so it's resulted in this traumatic relationship with the earth right? Traumatic relationship with reproduction, traumatic relationship with all these things that are actually really necessary for us to be in the future. And, you know, I like fucking with all that. So what I keep thinking about is like, what is the most anti-capitalist way to be Black in the future? And the answer that keeps coming back to me is pleasure. There's something about making it all pleasure, like that there's no work, that it's all like, what is it you are called to do? What is it you are purposed to do? It feels good when you are doing what you are purposed 
to do and how do we create a future in which that's that's what blackness feels like, a, a, like a cultural distinction inside of humanity and not a distraction from our humanity or something we have to continuously heal from. And when you ask like, you know, we were like, what is culture? What, what is culture? And I made, I was like writing this list that I was like, it's creativity that makes us understand where we come from and understand that where we're going could be a compelling place, right? Because I'm like, I write dystopian things. <laughs> I write, and I'm trying to heal from even that because I know that that is ancestral hopelessness still working its way through me that we have every reason to feel depressed right now today about the future that was created by the past decisions of mostly white men that impact all of us. And yet we are creative enough to generate something else. And I think culture is responsible for generating that abundance. Cultural is responsible for generating a new concept of ourselves. I think gender is already doing this. So gender is already starting to function as its nature, which is biodiversity, right? Like in nature, the healthy ecosystems are biodiverse. There's every kind of gender. And if we need to, we change genders. I think race is going to develop in that same way. It's part of our biodiversity. It's something delicious and distinct about us. It's the, the thing I'm trying to imagine is how much healing, how far will we have to go until blackness is no longer even associated with slavery as the first story, right? Like that doesn't mean it disappears, but how far do we have to go into, like I'm a, I'm a survivor and that's not the central story of my life. It's not the central story of any day of mine anymore, right? Like something has happened in that healing. I'm like, what does that collective healing look like? And culturally, I think we're the ones who are writing that story. So yeah, I, I also think that evolution has to feel possible for black people. And we look back, we can see how we have been evolving, but I feel like we have to really be able to imagine like what, what is the evolution of blackness? Because all of space is black. I imagine that many aliens are black. <laughs> like I'm like blackness is the majority of all existence. How do we evolve into that vastness? You know, I'm, I'm excited about that. Yeah, thank you. I um, again, I'll I'll keep thinking about this too because it's so central to the project. Um, you know, what do we what do we bring um, with us, and what do we leave behind? So I'll be thinking about that as we write up. Um, you know, I, I'm going to announce this here. I guess is we're going to we're going to do this next year. Um, this isn't like a one off, so we'll have um, we'll iterate a little bit. You know, because I do like what we have, um, but it's always good to iterate some. So uh, you touched on dystopian stories right before this. We were talking about movies and stories and music that's getting us through the pandemic. And um, Sheree, you said, like, you know, I love me some dystopian stories and you name dropped like a few. Um, and with this project from the beginning, because it comes from FIX, um, Risk Solutions Lab, which is focused on hope and optimistic solutions, uh, climate solutions that can get us um, out of this crisis. And so we knew from the beginning, we would have like hope would be a big part of this project. Um, and so what I wanna ask, and I'm gonna move this around, but I'll start with Cherie is, and I'll talk about this from my point of view is like, there's like an addiction to dystopian, uh, you know, violent, um, and apocalyptic stories. I love like these like stories, like some of them are my favorite, but, but how do we how do we how do we not make that like the norm? Like I kind of think of it as like a cup, you know. There's two cups. There's one that's you know full of this dystopian kind of like you know anger-filled, violent um, you know images and media, and then the other one's full of hope um, and optimism and solutions. And if you drink from the dystopian cup, you're just going to fill your body with that. And then so I'm recently trying to move towards filling more of the hope, and I hope this project. Um, did that so that more people are drinking from that cup. So I just want to know, like, do you have any, like, way, how do you think we can get out of this, like, love of dystopian uh, stories? Because it seems to be not something that's just a love affair that I have. Well, one thing, it's just expanding the idea of what hope is. 
like when I say I like a dystopian, it's because I like the the hope that's inside this dystopian. They give you a jacked up world that's all broken and full of falling apart, and then they show you people who've been affected by their trauma. They've been affected by their insecurity. They've been affected by their past histories and all these other um, identities that Adrian was talking about that get latched onto you that you didn't even get to choose, right, as you move through your life. And then they have to reform community. They have to find a way to break apart from that stuff. Usually they have to collaborate in order to survive, right? So that's the part that I tap into, right, that part of hope. But what, how do we can, But why do you have to start from there? Why do you have to start, right? From a broken world, why do you have to start from um, from the um, from the edges of, of a collapse? Right, chaos does not have to be the origin. And one way we can change that is by expanding our idea of what it means to tell a story, expanding what narrative is. And so I was thinking about like this new project that we just completed, which is Africa Risen, coming out from tour next year, and it's a collection of Afro diasporic short stories. It is science fiction, fantasy, and horror written, written from people in the diaspora, whether you're in Canada, you know, North America, or the Caribbean, or South America, wherever you are in the world, or you know, in Russia, we have you know, African writers in Russia, or whether you are on the continent itself, right? Writing deep in the heart of your own traditions and culture. And out of that, there are so many different ways of telling a story. And in those stories, there isn't this idea of the single Western person that has all of the action happen to them. And they're the ones that have to decide what's going to happen. And it's all about, you know, the nature of the story is trauma. The nature of the story is chaos and, and conflict. You don't have to define storytelling from a place of conflict, right? So that's another part, a way that you can kind of tease out and expand what it means to be hopeful. You can also tell stories in the round in a communal way where each person's voice is important to the telling. And in that you get each person's stream of hope coming through and building on the vision of the world. Um, so one way is just to start off and say, hey, we are not in this place of a dystopia, 2200 or 2400 or however far you push it um, for the next um, version of this. You, you, you let them know we are starting from a place of abundance. We are starting from a place of, of um, where each life is treated as if it does matter. And that is, that is drawn through every institution that's a part of the society. It is reinforced by that society and by the mechanisms they choose to govern themselves with. And once you have that, then you can move forward. Um, Nalo Hawkinson and Opender Mihan did a book called So Long Been Dreaming, right? Uh, it was uh, short science fiction and fantasy of um, post-colonial science fiction and fantasy. And that was a difficult challenge for some of us to try to get outside of the history of colonialism, neocolonialism, and all these other isms and all the other thing histories, right? Um, there are Black people on the planet who have no reference to slavery in the way that maybe others in the diaspora have. They have other stories that they want to tell. They have another first story that comes to mind when they think of the nation that they are from, the culture in which they claim, right? Um, and a lot of times that is from a place of hope and creativity, art and vision. So, you know, move, you're moving, you move the, 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 the goal line from this is where the story is because we all know that that chromey, you know, late runner looking future, right? <laughs> With the neon and everything and rain and rusted metals and things like that. And you can take it to a whole nother place. Um, and you just remind readers that that's a possibility and tell them and have them invite them to tell the stories from that point on. Because humans are still gonna be human, right? <laughs> They're still gonna be human. There's still gonna be things that we're reaching and striving for, even in a beautiful, aesthetically pleasing, um, you know, wonderfully rich, biodiverse world, we're still going to be interacting with it, it. So there's lots of room for these kinds of hopeful stories. Yeah. yeah, and that's why Wakanda, right? That's why Wakanda was so, like, you know, powerful for so many people to see that because it was, you know, it, it flipped the script. Like, we weren't in the dilapidated hood. We were in this amazing um, super tech, the most tech society um, in, in the Marvel world. Uh, but, but so 
Yeah, I just, I, I really am feeling everything you said around that. And I was going to move this around, but I feel like you thoroughly <laughs> answered the question um, and just took it in so many places. So I'm going to move this to Kiase uh, and ask you a different question. Did anything surprise you about these stories? Like, is there something you want to lift up that surprised you? Um, there were 12 stories, so I don't expect you to remember all the the, the names of them. Um, but was there anything do, happening there that surprised you? I know in our original conversation, when I sat down and asked you to be a judge, you said, I want stories where you see the perspective of from the animal's perspective. Um, I know that there was this story called uh, Greenland Shark, the last Greenland Shark. Did did that surprise you? Did you like that one? <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I definitely like that one. Um, I want to try to tie this into the conversation, too, about abundance and dystopia, though. Um, I, I, I liked it because I like the feeling in my chest of excitement when I read something I do not expect. I think a lot of what we're talking about here, like, sort of subtextually is, you know, conversations about the human, the post-human, and, like, even, like, the pre-human. But what I loved about what some of these stories did is I think that they, like, took not, not traditional narratives or traditional, quote-unquote, plots, but sometimes plots that were seemingly traditional, but I think they placed them in a different container. And this is what I want to talk about when I think about what Shree was talking about. You know, we have, I think about the Cosby show. I, I, I was never, I, I didn't really love the Cosby show, but my friends did. And the reason I didn't fuck with the Cosby show was because to me, that shit was science fiction, right? It was, you had these two black professionals working in white spaces who never came home and talked shit about what they experienced as black professionals in white spaces. That to me is, I mean, imagine that shit being pitched as a horror or dystopian science fiction. That would have been, I think, the most genius shit ever. And I think you can do it if you take out the laugh track and replace the laugh track with really thoughtful music. I actually think that the stories that worked the best here took conventions of traditional plot but but spun them in ways that I'd never seen through genre. And I think when you take one genre and you place another genre into conversation, that necessarily in and of itself doesn't make anything new. You still have to ask yourself, okay, how does the meshing of like this and this change again, the way the characters walk, if they walk, the way the characters talk, if they talk, and the minutia of the character. So one of the things I love most about these stories was in addition to like incredible, what I would call like story signatures, there was just like some weird fucking minutia fam, like weird things that made me wonder like what genre, if at all, I would place any of these stories in. And to me, that's what I get excited about. When you take something that I think I know, you take a beat that I think I know, and not only do you add a different like thing, or you know, you drop a bass out at the end, you call that thing like rainbow music. And I'm like, what the fuck? That's rainbow music now? And I think a lot of the stories, or enough of the stories, did that to me to make me really excited. Yeah, I definitely felt that way. I, you know, I think I learned from these stories. Um, I broken from the colony, um, which is a trans girl's experience. Um, in Bermuda, um, in shifts between um, that their experience um, and being, uh, 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 um, you know, in Bermuda um, underwater um, and escaping. And I think uh, the author even said, like, I want to live in a world where even the the water is um, ho hormone filled, right? Um, like that sort of abundance for for their community and themselves. Um, so I, I like a lot of these stories did things that you know I wasn't expecting, and that's what I really liked. Um, you know, it brought me to places that I didn't expect to be, and so I agree with you on that piece. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is um, diction, uh, lexicon, um, how we shift language. Um, I, and Adrian, you do this, so I'm going to bring this over to you. Um, how does language, the language we choose to use in our stories, um, start to shift that narrative or, or change where we, the change the way we're looking at the world? You know, I feel like this is the uh, remix of the culture question, right? Like language, one of the things I think about for a future language or for future, like what do we want to bring with us 
is like, how do we find language that actually feels at home on our tongues? And I feel like we're doing this all the time in the vernacular. And I, I'll, I laugh a lot. We were uh, chatting before we got in the public eye about what we've been watching lately. And one of the things that amazes me, I, I watch TV, I like watching reality shows, I like watching everything. And what I see is black vernacular everywhere, like every single where, like there's no place you can open something up and someone's not like, it ain't getting what's supposed to Gabe. And I'm like, what? No, um, <laughs> how do you know this? Who are you? Like, um, and and I think it's one of the ways that we decenter whiteness, we decenter English, we decenter colonizer, we decenter um, narrative, right? It's like, actually, whose language are you even using to tell this? And we can always be remixing it. But when I think about dystopian language, you know, Sheree, I loved how you were talking about like, what are those elements, the common elements, you know, you kind of know you're landing in a dystopian story within the first two paragraphs usually, because it's gray, there's rain, there's concrete, there's this, there's that. And it's like, what are the ways that language is actually, I think all the time telling us about capitalism falling apart, you know, like, but we don't say this is another story about capitalism falling apart. But when you actually talk about a dystopian novel, mostly what you're saying is, we're processing anticipatory grief over capitalism's fall and how what is the language that helps us feel like that could actually be the most beautiful thing like if this system as it inevitably will falls apart because it's too top heavy then there's all this what we know from watching nature is that the language of nature is constant and abundant and constant creating like i was based in detroit for most of this contest and every building that has even started to fall down, nature reclaims it. And she's telling a different story. She's telling a story where the building was the temporary thing and she is the permanent thing, right? Earth is the permanent thing. And climate is a language. I think that the hurricane is a language. The wildfires are a language. This is all the ways earth is telling us the same way that when I have inflammation in my joints, I'm like, my body is telling me something I just did isn't aligned with my future. <laughs> And in the same way, the planet is telling us, you all are doing some stuff. It's not aligned with our future. I'm really curious about how, how much do we need to decentralize the, the sense of ourselves as humans, as the protagonist of the story of earth? How do we decenter ourselves in the story so that it's a whole earth story? Because I think that decentering allows us to hear other language, right? Hear other communication, other species calling out, crying out, asking us to, to create conditions in which we can all actually continue. Um, I also want to say something about the language of individual versus collective. I felt like the stories out of this collection that really moved me were the ones where people were still having to make choices because even though we are a massive super organism, we function at the cellular level making our individual choices. But over and over, we saw people having to make choices that were collectively minded. Right. And I'm like, I'm really interested in the language that gives us collective protagonists, collective mindedness, collective assessments of the future. And I think that indigenous writers have a lot to teach us about this. I think that that's one of the places we need to keep bringing our attention as we move forward. Appreciate that. Really appreciate yeah. that. Um, so we're going to move the conversation to narrative shifting. Um, I'll introduce Brian, who uh, many of the folks, uh, you know, no, um, from the Columbia side of things. And so Brian is an award-winning writer who I know over at Gizmodo, but um, has also written for Wall Street Journal, The Guardian, um, and is also at the Columbia um, School for in, in Climate Society. That's the graduate program there. Uh, and so I'm going to hand it over to Brian. Brian's going to talk about narrative shifting um, and chop it up with these folks. Uh, and then you'll hear more from me in a few minutes. Awesome. Thanks so much, Tori. It's such a pleasure to be here. And I honestly just want to do a quick shout out to Grist Fix for putting this together. This concept of storytelling for a future that doesn't suck is something that I really need as the guy that really covers the part that sucks a lot um, as a journalist. So thank you all for putting this together, first of all. Um, and you know, for a panelists, I mean, this conversation has been really fascinating. And one thing I've heard come up a few times and that I actually want to drill into a bit is this idea of, you know, this Western individual mindset and the role that it kind of plays in shaping the stories we tell and, you know, shaping our society. And so actually, Morgan, I want to kick it to you because I know you brought this up earlier. 
you know, talking about the the impact of this mindset on you know our current state in society. Why is it so important to shift away from that mindset? And you know, how can storytelling begin to kind of reshape it and think about it? Um, you know, our relationship with either each other or the world in different ways. I think it's important to shift away from that mindset that you mean a sort of individualist mindset, because if we allow ourselves to be hardened by, hardened by the world, we'll never move forward. Um, that's why it's been helpful when I would see, for me personally, when I'd be online and I would hear Black, read Black women say, maintain your softness, like continue to remain soft because this world will literally grind you down. Um, so I think that it's important to stay away from that mindset because <laughs> that's kind of what the enemy wants, right? For you to be hardened, for you to be debilitated, jaded, and complacent, and to not hope for more, and then nothing else will happen. And the second part of your question was, what was how does storytelling help us to get rid of that mindset? Yeah, and like, how can we get to like a different space as well, just like mentally? What does that look like? I think, you know, reading these stories or reading other stories of uh, climate fiction stories, it just reminds us that we're not alone. You know, there are other people, regardless of where they are in the world, that are thinking about, like, there has to be something better than this. Not when we die either, like, right now. Like, we can create that reality right now. So I think that that is a sort of balm for me personally to know that when I read, I'm never alone. But even with these climate disasters that are happening and we're realizing right as Tori pointed out when I talked about you know my county in South Jersey I mean we get bad storms I've never seen a tornado before and there were viral videos of, of houses their roofs just torn up and you're realizing that no one is safe and if no one is safe then that is the time to really band together and even if I can't be near you physically whether it's because of distance or COVID-19 restrictions the words can be the bloodline there. Um, and I think that that is what is most important with writing and documentation. Some of this stuff, I, I truly believe, some of the stuff that we've read, it's going to happen. Just like what happened with Black Mirror on the more dystopian stuff we're seeing, like, oh, wow, why isn't Black Mirror out right now? Because well, they don't know how to keep up with the material that's happening in, in reality. But then on the flip side, on the optimistic side, I do believe that some of the stuff we read, it's going to happen, you know? Um, so I think that it's important that, you know, when we think about narratives, just the way our mind can extend thinking about the possibility, even if we don't like the story for whatever plot, characterization, syntax, whatever, all the mechanics, just the idea that someone plants into someone else's head, that this could be a possibility. We never know how that's going to sprout up again in the future. I love that. Let a, let a thousand flowers bloom. I mean, that's a beautiful idea. Um, and, you know, I think that to do that, we also sort of need to like, you know, maybe like treat the soil right and sort of get there. And I wonder, you know, I guess, Kiasi, I want to throw this to you. I'm, I'm just kind of curious. It is really easy. I mean, I say this as a journalist, like it's really easy to get locked in the doom mindset and to look at what's happening now and see what's wrong. I mean, you know, the climate is going haywire, inequality is rising, um, all these issues are happening. And so, you know, I'm wondering if you can give us a little insight. You talked about this idea that imagination is kind of like this antidote to capitalism. And so what does that mean? How do we get into that more imagination, you know, focused space to start to think about something new, to make a new narrative? I think we accept the times when we actually do do this work. Do you know what I mean? I think sometimes we have to do new work or we have to do engage in new pleasure. You know, maybe Adrian would say new kinds of pleasure, but often sometimes think that, you know, I just, I'll own this. You know, one of the things, I'm a writer, right? But sometimes I think I fail myself the most when I'm looking for new assemblages of words to describe something that I think I haven't seen when I just don't have to, the will to describe it in my actual lived life. Do you know what I mean? Like, I actually find pleasure in listening to people I don't know talk mad shit to each other lovingly. Like, that to me makes me a better friend, partner, contributor to the earth. But but why is this the first time I'm ever saying that in a public space? Well, because I'm afraid. But what else did I'm, am I afraid of naming that that I would call, you know, 
healthy, solid, pleasurable, possible, possible work. So I, I actually just often think that Lord knows we have to do things on a major, massive organizational scale. I just want to put that out there. I think I think without organization, this shit is, I don't even know why we're having this conversation. But I also just think that that the organized entity is made up of like like millions and millions of imaginations. And I think I have hundreds of thousands of imaginations in me that I've been like afraid to actually name and or like like follow. And I think when you're afraid to name your imaginative impulses, you're afraid to name particular kinds of experiences, those experiences aren't gonna be named by anyone else. So you're gonna see somebody else out there simulate an experience that you think is yours and you're gonna call that yours at the expense of your own. So again, I'm not trying to, I don't wanna run away from that by locating it too much in the individual, but I think that the individual and the necessity to ruggedly revise what we call work and pleasure on like literally like in our bodies when we're talking to ourselves, without that kind of work, the organizational shit that we push forward is always gonna fail. And so I, 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 I just believe in sort of like naming. And I think, I, I, think, I think organizing around the naming of these like pleasurable work sites that we all bring to everything we do is, is one of the ways with the end goal being organization and, 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 and organized will. Because at the end of the day, like the thing about this is yes, we wanna be all utopic and some of us wanna be heterotopic or whatever, but this shit is a fight. But I just don't know if you can even prepare yourself to fight well if you haven't taken advantage or like even named all the wonder that you bring to the fight. And I think that these racial legends, these class legends, these gender legends that like sort of like choking the life out of us don't want us to do that work, which means that the organization that we do do often is gonna be lacking. And I wonder like, you know, along those lines, I mean, how do we kind of balance? Cause I mean, there's no denying, right? Like, things that got us to this place, I mean, are, are very bad things. I mean, there are things that have, you know, oppressed people, have led to just humongous global problems that are now affecting the entire planet and climate change. So, you know, I'm wondering how you kind of balance the fact that, like, we do have some serious stuff to confront here. Um, there's no denying that the past has led us to this kind of like dark precipice that we're on right now, but, you know, we do need to change course and shift that narrative in the future. And so I guess, you know, I turn this over to Adrian. I'm wondering if you can give us a little insight about how you kind of balance that need to acknowledge the history that got us to this place with the fact that we should be shifting towards this idea of more abundance, of more pleasure, of a different future that is possible? Yeah, I, I appreciate this question. You know, I feel like I'm sitting in, um, I've been sitting and facing some of my own hopelessness, uh, you know, figuring out like, how do I alchemize this? Because I'm the hope person. <laughs> you know, I'm supposed to be like, the person who's looking at the future, like, yes, we can do it. And um, and this past year and a half has been hard. And something I said a couple of years ago was things are not getting worse, they're getting uncovered. And we have to hold each other tight and keep pulling back the veil, right? And I, my friends, I have friends who joke with me like, is it getting worse yet? It feels like it's getting worse. Is it, is it is now worse? You know what I'm like? It's still all the uncovery, but part of what I'm reckoning with is the fact that I experienced things getting worse is a sign that of my privilege. In, in spite of the history, in spite of the legacies of my peoples, there's some privilege there. And that privilege is being etched away at, right? I can't just travel anywhere I want to. That feels worse, right? I can't go see the ones I love. That feels worse. I think climate will continue. I, I also think climate and COVID are, are somehow related. I don't know that we'll see it for a little while or understand it fully. But I feel like COVID is going to keep adapting until we adapt, right? I think there's something that like, it's, I don't think it's an accident that all the shifts we need to make in order to help contain COVID are ones that are also good for the planet. Like stay in your house, <laughs> stop traveling, don't get on planes, stop using fossil fuels, like all of those things. I don't think there's an accident to that. And I think it's a little beyond, it's like just beyond my ability to really comprehend how it works um, in part because I feel so uncomfortable with the level of mortality that we're facing and who's facing that. I think that's also a thing we have to figure out how to be in right relationship with. And all of my work right now is grief. Everything I'm writing is grief and figuring out if we don't learn to grieve well, if we don't learn to grieve as a celebration, if we don't figure out how to grieve as an act of love and that we need time to do that as a species, I don't know that we'll be able to pivot towards the future because I think the grief is actually overwhelming. And 
I feel like every story that we're writing, every story that we're telling, everything we need to be sharing with each other now has to either be preparing ourselves for that spiritual work of grief and transformation and like alchemizing grief into the future, or it needs to be something that turns on our powers, right? Because I'm like, I also know, I deeply believe we do have some kind of superpower shit going on. And I think if you look at the next generation, like all the babies, everyone basically that I know under the age of 20 is like, I have a sensory this, I have a something this, I'm ADD, I'm this, I'm that. I'm like, every single one of them can feel more than the generations that ever felt before, right? Some of that might be because we're allowing more feeling to happen. Like there's more adults who are like, holy crap, it ruined my life not feeling. I'm gonna make sure you can. But generationally, it doesn't matter if the parents are ready, the kids are feeling more. I think that is also part of what is awakening. Like, um, I feel like I've been reading more and more that makes me think we're in an evolution that we're not aware of yet. And we're dropping out of just being able to think we can figure it all out here. And I'm guilty of this. Tori, maybe I said this to you, but I feel like I've been traveling as if my brilliance was a carbon offset and that somehow it would be okay for me to keep being at odds with the future as long as I kept saying I was aligned with it. And I think right now is a place where it's like, no, we have to feel in alignment with it and act in alignment with it. And we have to be in relationships that are alignment with it. Like what we do is gonna be much more important than just what we say. And the stories we tell have to be ones that pick, make people wanna do different things in order to be in right relationship with the future. I don't wanna write any more stories that make people cry and set it down and forget it. Like I wanna make stories and make people like, like what Octavia E. Butler did, like I need to pack a go bag. <laughs> I need to be prepared for traversing the future in a different way. Like how do we write in that way? How do we create in that way? I love that answer. And honestly, like, you know, as somebody, so I mean, scientifically, like the grief thing is real. And just last week, there was a study that came out showing that young adults are experiencing climate grief in ways that, you know, we're only just beginning to get a handle on. And that's, you know, one study looking at one thing very scientifically, but when, you know, from anecdotally, this professor at Columbia, when I work with students, I mean, I can feel that they carry something in here. And I think that that alchemy is so important for where we need to go next. So I think that answer is an inspiration to me. And I hope that's an inspiration to everyone else listening to this and certainly my students, but all parties, because we need to be really working on that alchemy. Um, so I know that I'm going to try to sneak in one more question here before we invite Tori back on. And Shri, I want to kick it to you, although, I mean, if other folks have answers too, you know, we can also, we can have everyone hop in as a lightning round. Um, you know, hopefully there are a lot of folks on this call that are super excited to write climate fiction, tell stories, all that stuff, and change the narrative that way. But there may be some folks that are just here that are, you know, working in, in their day jobs, maybe they're students, and, you know, maybe they don't want to write stories. Maybe they want to figure out other ways to shift the narrative. I'm wondering if there are any storytelling techniques or ideas that, you know, that you have that you think could help folks in their daily lives shift the narrative on climate? Um, well, one thing I did want to say just to add on to the conversation that just happened is that part of the, the challenge that we're having is that the people who are going to make the decisions about this climate change and whether or not we make any decisions that are going to actually impact it are not the ones necessarily to have to be convinced. The people in other communities and particularly marginalized communities around the world have been knowing that this is a major issue because they are having to pick up their homes. They are dealing with mudslides. They are dealing with famine. They are dealing with droughts. They are dealing with all of the things, like Morgan said, the roof being gone. All of these things are happening to them over and over again. And no one has been listening. No one has been listening. It's a present thing. So we have to figure out a way so that we change the way that we relate to the world. We change our economic systems. We change the way our daily lives are moving. Because until those big changes happen, and I mean the masses, the, the masses decide, you know what, I'm going to have to give up some comfort, right? I'm going to have to give up some convenience. You know, the thing that we love so much of science fiction is dealing with the technology. But we're going to have to get let some of those things go if we actually want to achieve some of the, you know, the climate fiction dreams that are being created on the page. We're gonna to have to change for real, in the real world, in terms of our economic relationship globally. And that's a hard, hard thing that is going to take more than just nice stories in order to take place. It's gonna take more than that. And I think we need to be very real 
So if we're going to talk about, you know, you know, just in our everyday lives, do part of the writer's work is doing research, doing that due diligence and researching. Go and find out where the, the silences are in your knowledge. Go and find the spaces where you don't know and you can add to it because you can't write what you don't know, right? It, to some extent, you have to fill the well with something. So um, Grist is a great place. Uh, Fix is a wonderful resource. Um, you know, Brian is doing amazing stuff at, at Columbia. But if you're not at, you know, at the Ivy League, where can you get this information, right? Where can you go? Um, find those green activists in your community. I'm inspired by people right here in Memphis, in Bethel Grove, tr trying to keep an oil line out of um, a very historic old community called Boxtown here in Memphis, South Memphis. I'm inspired by people far away, like the young Ugandan activist, uh, Vanessa Natake, right, who has been, you know, sounding a bell. This is a long bell that some communities have been calling all over the world. So part of it is getting informed, doing your research to figure out what are small steps that I can take in my everyday life that can begin to make an impact and a change. Because that's the thing. It's so big. How do we get our hand and our minds around it, right? Start doing that. Jot those things down. Jot down what you would like to see differently in your own concentric circle of geometric space around you, you know, and, and then go from there. Then the characters and the stories and the people will come to you, you know, but you got to part of our work is the imagination work is the quiet part you do by yourself. And part of that, that is doing the research. And then you go and you map out the world that you hope to see. But it's just those small steps. It's a big step at the same time that the world has to make. Right. Because we don't want to give up our sugar. We don't want to give up, you know, some of this electricity. We don't want to give up these things. Right. Um, you know, not everybody wants to move away from polyester or whatever it is, nylon and stuff. We don't all want to do cotton, but we're going to have to make those choices if all of these things are going to change, you know. Um, so that's, that's, I wanted to just say that because this is a big thing that is beyond just our storytelling. And we got to get money out of politics in these shores in America. And there are other changes, I'm sure, that need to be done in other places. But part of it is definitely getting corporate money out of our politics. It will never change as long as companies like Exxon and others are able to dictate our environmental policy here and around the world. It will never change. So we have to change that. Right. I love it. I think getting that working inside, feeling that, you know, finding <laughs> what, that, what that silence is, <laughs> and then working on that outside to quiet down the noise from places like Exxon so that there's less influence and people can speak up. That's beautiful. Um, I would ask a million more questions of all of you and keep you here all day, but I don't want to do that. Um, I know Tori wants to come back on the stage here and ask some questions, including from listeners who have been paying, you know, listening to the live stream here. So I want to welcome Tori back to the stage and take it away. Thanks, Brian. I appreciate that. Um, what an important discussion this whole thing has been. So we have um, about 10 more minutes and we're going to have uh, two more questions. I think we'll be able to squeeze in. These questions are from listeners, and I apologize. We had hundreds of questions come through, and I, we could only the team could only pick two. So the first one that's coming in, and I'm going to read these because they're not my questions, so I don't know them um, by heart or whatever. Um, how best can authors who aren't in certain like marginalized communities write about those communities? Um, how do they write about them in a respectful way uh, and you know create a world of inclusivity? I'll, I'll go to Morgan. Did you see my face? Is that why you uh, pinged it to me? Um, I, I saw it light up. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, crap. Um, so the question is, how do writers who are not of the marginalized communities that they want to write about do that? Is that what the question is? Yeah, that's right. And Okay, so I have a couple of questions there myself before. And this is actually inspired by Alex Chee's um, piece in uh, Vulture. Um, it, 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 I, I have to find it. it's amazing. But it's a like question to ask yourself before you start to write about people of color. And it's like, what relationship do you have to the, this community in your regular life, right? Do, is the, are these only people you interact with when they're providing a service to you? Do are these people who you break bread with? Um, 
I also think that you have to ask yourself, if we're going to talk about climate change, you have to talk about power. We have to talk about the haves and the have-nots. So, for example, if you are writing about, um, I don't know, an historical uh, Black community in, uh, in California, for example, um, that's being uprooted, and you just moved to the neighborhood, if you're not willing to confront that, in your piece itself and what it says about displacement um, and those who have the threat of being displaced, then that's not going to be for you. You have to be willing to be uncomfortable and be in that space. So first find out your relationship to those people, read from those communities, especially, um, and also figure out like how, in in terms of power and access, how, excuse me, in terms of power and access, how are you going to grapple with that in your writing? Because if you obscure it, you're only reinforcing white supremacy. You're only reinforcing how power works, right? You, it's so pervasive, it's invisible, and you hide your hand. And that's not going to do the world any good when it comes to literature. We already have enough of that already. Yeah, so I'm going to ask the same question uh, to Kiase, and um, I'll repeat it just so that you know um, the question. Essentially, like, you know, folks saying from the community, are they okay? Is it okay for them to write about the community? If they do do so, how should they approach that? Yeah, I mean, I always think those questions are sort of, um, they're funny to me because (laughs) I think the people who often never have to be given permission to do blank are asking us, do we have permission to do blank? Do you know what I mean? And so, I'm, I'm going to say, uh, yes, you can do that. You can do whatever the fuck you want, obviously, which is which is part of the reason we're in the situation that we're in. But at the end of the day, I think sometimes, it, you know, I'm thinking about what Cherie said about the hard work. I mean, if, if that question is sincere, I think sometimes we have to do the hard work of talking to people, mining the literature that came before us, looking at the theories that exist around us, creating art. And even if that art gets accepted, sometimes we have to be like, yo, you know what? I might not be the right person to put this story out in the world. Do you see what I'm saying? And and, and what I think we often do as writers, as creators, is, you know, I think at the end of the day, we think something is good, valuable, potentially transformational because we did it. When often it's the opposite of that because we did it. And so, again, I just want to bring capitalism back in. And I think you have to try your best to write the best story, create the best art object you can. And then ask yourself, what are the ethics of that art object coming in the world via you? And if the ethics of that art object coming in the world via you are not, you know, potentially like transformative and or loving, not just radical, I think you got to get look for someone else to put that put a different kind of art object into the world. But I think you have to do the work to create, to try to create rigorous art first. Don't just take yourself out of the out of the running because you know that's what KSA or Adrian or you know Cherie said. You know what I mean? So I just think I think if somebody's really sincerely asking, do the work, but then ask yourself, do you need to and deserve to capitalize off the work you've done? I, I think that's what I that's what I would say. Yeah, I just want to throw in on that. If you don't have relationships with anyone in that community who could give you feedback and be reading that, pause, pause, right? Don't do it. If you have those relationships and you, you're like, oh, I know I can trust, I can get some feedback, I can get, you know, be in relationship with other people who can look at this and be like, hmm, you know, like I lived in Detroit for 12 years and I still sent my novel to five other people who were born in Detroit because I was like, I only know 12 years of Detroit, <laughs> you know, like you just have to know that you can get feedback from people who, who will know more than you. And there's always people who know more than you. And there are other great resources. Once you've done the, the philosophical question, am I the right person to be telling this story, which is basically all we're saying, or am I, am I the right person to be telling this story? Who else in this community has already told this story and what was their take on it? You know, and do I add to the conversation? Does my art add to it? in a way that, that is significant and needs to be in the world. Once you're able to answer those with affirmations, then you can go to places like Writing the Other, which is a wonderful workshop that Nisi Shaw and Kay Tempest Bradford 
Um, they teach online. They teach it in person, and uh, you know, in certain settings, certain you know, beyond the, the pandemic. Um, um, they also have books. Cynthia Ward um, uh, was the co-author of the original book, I believe. Writing the other, these are resources that have already done some of that questioning and have done some of the work to help guide people from different communities. Because it's not always about nation and race, but it's also identity and other things uh, that we are questioning um, gender um, and, 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 and identity that we are also you know, asking, how do I write the other, whatever that other is? So yeah, um, there are other ways to, um, there are other resources out there available, um, but always ask those good questions, those hard questions. You know, because you might not be the person that needs to tell that story. Um, and if you decide that you're not, that's perfectly fine because you're really supposed to be pulling the stories that come out of you, that you, only you can tell the world uniquely and that you bring your vision to. Um, so those are the ones that really stand out. Yeah, I really appreciate that because we definitely got a lot of those questions even before this this Zoom moment that we're having. Like people were like, is it okay to submit a story like this with a character? Like asking us all these questions. And I was like, just submit your stories and then we'll review them. <laughs> um, but, but all these answers um, will help us next year. People can review this, look at this and um, see it as a, you know, input, you know. Um, so we're about um, wrapping up now because we're hitting 315 and I want to respect everyone's time. I know other folks got places to be and go. Um, but first, wanted to thank everyone um, before I close. Uh, thank you, Brian. Thank you, folks at Columbia. Really appreciate the partnership. Orion Magazine, appreciate y'all. You've been helpful from the beginning. Amy Brady over there. And um, to Kiase, Cherie, Morgan, and Adrian, Love y'all. Really appreciate this conversation. It was enriching. It helped. Um, it, it, I learned so much. Like, I learned so much from y'all. So I really do appreciate that. Uh, we will see more of this. Uh, imagine we'll have a year two, um, hopefully a year three, year four. Uh, and we'll probably make some other moments um, b between now and when we launch. Um, and, you know, just if you haven't already done so, go ahead and read those stories. There's 12 amazing stories um, filtered down from 1,100. These judges um, had a role to play in picking those stories. And um, you can find them at grist.org slash fix, F-I-X. Have a beautiful day. <laughs>